I'm not running a story about a public gathering where the lead anecdote and quote is from an unnamed homeless woman. But her story is great. Look at that quote. It's a perfect quote. Best quote I could ever ask for. And that's my concern at this point. Jesus Christ. Get to hell with you if you think I made it up. The Wire. It's one of the greatest shows ever, and I've wanted to make a video on it for years, but I've never been able to because it's such a daunting subject. It covers so much ground. Where do you even begin? You could have an entire college class centered around The Wire and still only scratch the surface of how deep the show goes. Because of that, and because I'm a pretty lazy person, I've never been able to get past the outline stage, and I kind of gave up trying. But then I came across this seemingly unrelated video, The Fall of a Superstar Psychologist by the channel Quant. Though the title didn't include the name of the superstar psychologist in question, I immediately recognized him. This is Dan Ariely, psychology professor at Duke University, prolific author, and a prominent figure in the School of Behavioral Economics. I've read a couple of Ariely's books and watched several of his presentations and found him to be an interesting guy. His area of expertise is, of course, behavior, specifically how people behave in ways that go against their own interests, and how unnoticed environmental cues can have a huge impact on your actions. For a quick example of what Ariely's all about, let's check out this TED talk he gave about an online pharmacy that was trying to get customers to switch from expensive name brand drugs to identical yet much cheaper generics. All the customers had to do to save a lot of money was fill out a simple form and mail it back. But even after the financial benefits were explained, no one did. Even when the pharmacy sweetened the deal by offering free medication for an entire year, still almost no one switched. Two things are happening at the same time. It's branded versus generic, but it's doing nothing versus is doing something. Apparently, I'm not the only lazy person out there. If doing nothing is a viable option, most of us will just do that. So the pharmacy hired Ariely to see if he could get people to switch, which begs the question, how did he do it? Well, one thing he didn't do was try to get people to fill out the old form. Instead, he sent out a new form and said, if you don't fill this out and send it back, your medication will be stopped altogether. That took away the option of doing nothing. Now people had to choose between expensive name brand drugs and cheaper generics, and when they did, just about everybody switched to generics. I love this stuff. I read these kind of books all the time. Books that take ideas from science and psychology and economics and wherever else and then turn it into an easy to read narrative for the masses. It's right up my alley because as a lazy person, I'm not gonna sift through peer reviewed journals or pour over data and I'm sure as hell not gonna conduct my own placebo controlled experiments. And that's okay. We don't all have to be scientists so long as the people who are and the people who present their findings are honest. That's why this video about Ariely got my attention because it alleges he wasn't, which oddly enough is what made me think of The Wire. If you've seen The Wire, and I hope you have, otherwise please go fix your life, then you know season 5 deals with, amongst other subjects, the media. We meet several characters from the Baltimore Sun, including Scott Templeton, an ambitious reporter who makes it clear his ultimate goal is to leave the Sun and write for a more prestigious paper like the New York Times or Washington Post. In order to do that, he needs to get more attention for the stuff he writes, and in in order to do that, Templeton plays loose with the facts really loose. You feel comfortable telling me where you got that? Not really. It being a source. If he can't get a good quote for a story, he makes it up. If he doesn't think a story is exciting enough on its own, he embellishes the truth. Templeton's big break comes when a serial killer emerges on the streets of Baltimore. And did he bite all of them? Not all. Just the latest ones. A biter. That's great. And, sensing this is gonna be big, he scoops everyone by pretending to be contacted by the killer, which allows him to then write an exclusive I talk to a psycho expose. I said, uh, what happens after 12, he said, quote, I go somewhere else, unquote. This works out even better than he could have hoped. Not only does it get him all the attention he wants, it leads to the real killer contacting him. Did you write any of your people that know nothing about me? What? Which allows him to then publish another bombshell story. How was him? Again. Templeton is a fraud. That's pretty obvious. What's not as obvious, however, is why. You could certainly argue from watching them work that he's just not very good at his job, so he lies in order to compensate. I resent the implication. I'm not gonna argue in favor of Templeton's talent or lack thereof, but I will say that if all he wanted was to report the truth, I bet he could. What I like most about it is that you didn't overwrite it. You really let this ex-marine just tell a story. Thanks, guys. In the war story that he embellished, he did do some solid reporting. He hit the streets and interviewed several homeless people, 
until he came across a former soldier who had an interesting story to tell, and which Templeton truthfully recounted. At least right up until he added some completely unnecessary lies because he thought the story would read better. I never said I was in a firefight. Not on that thing. I'm sorry, but you did. I think this really shows you what's going on in Templeton's head. His real problem isn't so much that he lacks talent, it's that he cares more about getting attention than about reporting the truth. If the truth doesn't align to what he thinks will get him the most attention, then he'll bend the truth until it fits the narrative he wants. And again, this is who I thought of when I learned about Dan Ariely. If you want to know all the details of what Professor Ariely was up to, definitely check out the links in the description. I just want to go over the two main scandals Ariely was involved in because they remind me so much of Templeton. The first involves a paper that Ariely and three others published that was based on data from a car insurance company that periodically asked customers to report how much they'd driven in a given period. Since driving less meant lower premiums, the drivers had a financial incentive to lie. Now, the insurance company already had a good idea of how much they'd driven, so they also had a good sense of who was being honest. What Ariely and his team did was change the form that the drivers recorded their mileage on so that instead of signing at the bottom and saying, I promise everything I wrote above is true, they had to sign their name and promise to be honest at the top before they'd written anything else. Those who filled out this new form went on to be significantly more honest than those who filled out the old one. And in the world of behavioral economics, this was considered a big deal. The paper Ariely and his co-authors published was massively cited and hugely influential. But there was a problem. When other researchers tried to replicate the findings, they couldn't. When the insurance company tried to replicate the findings, they couldn't. And when this watchdog group investigated the study, they came to the conclusion that the data was fabricated. The numbers were too perfect. A normal distribution curve would look like this. Ariely's data looked like this. When the watchdog group went public, Ariely agreed the numbers were bogus and the paper was retracted. This looked particularly bad for Ariely because he alone handled the data. But he claims he simply used the numbers the insurance company gave him. The insurance company denied this, saying the data they provided was very different from what wound up in Ariely's paper. Now, in fairness to Ariely, this is not the wire. We don't get to watch Templeton commit fraud right in front of us, so it's impossible to say exactly what happened. But as Rebecca Watson put it in this excellent video she made on the topic, even if you believe Ariely, in the very best light, Dan Ariely is completely inept at his job. Yeah, Ariely is supposed to be an expert at analyzing data. Yet he's claiming he looked at this and said, yup, totally legit, and then published it, which I have a hard time buying. I mean, what sounds more likely to you? A multi-billion dollar insurance company fabricated its own data for no logical reason, or a best-selling author with a bombshell story he wanted to tell changed the data so that it aligned with the narrative he thought would get him the most attention. If that wasn't bad enough, Ariely found himself in similar trouble when he and two other authors published another paper that again claimed people behaved more honestly if prompted. This time the claim was based on an experiment in which college students were given a math test that they self-graded and were then asked how well they did on, not knowing that their answers would later be verified. Before saying how well they did on the test, half the students were asked to recite the Ten Commandments, and those who were went on to be more honest than those who weren't. This was again considered a big deal. However, there was a problem. When other researchers tried to replicate the findings, their results weren't nearly as dramatic as Ariely's. To make matters worse, when the study itself was called into question, none of the paper's authors could say with certainty when and where the actual experiment took place. Ariely claimed it was conducted by a professor at UCLA nearly 20 years prior, but when he emailed her, she responded that the study he described in his paper didn't fit the protocol for how she conducted experiments. Nothing matched, from the sample size, to how the subjects were selected, to how they were compensated, to when the experiment would have taken place to how it would have been done. None of that, however, stopped Ariely from asking her for names and dates and to put out a statement that basically covered for him, which she rightly refused to do. Once again, it looked pretty bad for Ariely, and once again, that holds true even if you believe him. Best case scenario is he's terrible at his job. He makes grandiose claims based on suspect evidence that he does zero due diligence on. Worst case scenario, which I again find more likely, is he never had the data to begin with. He simply had a story he wanted to tell, so he told it. Evidence be damned, and when he got called out for it, he tried to blame someone else. So we've got a tale of two frauds here, one real and alleged, one fictitious and beyond any shadow of a doubt. And in both cases, you have got to love the irony. In Ariely's case, he set out to prove that people who have an incentive to lie probably will unless you somehow prevent them. And he proved it all right by lying about the way he claims to have proven it. 
allegedly. And make no mistake, he definitely had an incentive. Ariely isn't just a professor, he's a celebrity professor, part of an elite group who teach at the best schools, sign lucrative book deals, and get high-paying gigs as consultants and speakers. You want to reach that level of success, you better publish some earth-shattering research. If you do, the rewards will be great. If you don't, you might not even keep your job. While academia and journalism don't overlap perfectly, the term publish or perish I would say applies to both. The most coveted jobs in journalism, like the kind Templeton is after, require that you attract an abundance of eyeballs. You need to put out the kind of content that commands attention, like Templeton did with his pieces on the Baltimore Biter, who, get ready for the irony of all ironies, never actually existed. What? Biting's not sex, it's biting. Detectives Jimmy McNulty and Lester Freeman made him up after the major crimes unit they worked in was shut down due to budget cuts. When the money starts to flow, I'll get you all back on this somehow. Since taking down Baltimore's biggest and most violent drug gang wasn't considered a high priority, McNulty and Lester commanded attention by making it look like a serial killer was preying on the homeless. With Templeton's unsolicited assistance, You called the reporter, huh? No, actually. That asshole's making up his own shit. This got the public up in arms, which got these two the funding they needed, which they then funneled into going after Marlowe and his crew. That means if you go back to when Templeton committed fraud by pretending to talk to the biter, he himself had already been defrauded by this point. It wasn't until he claimed to have seen the biter abduct someone so he could publish yet another bombshell story that McNulty finally set him straight. You're as full of shit as I am, trapped in the same lie. Only difference is I know why I did it. You're not serious, you're accusing no. me. No. No, I'm a fucking joke. And so are you. Now get the fuck out of here. There's a lot to admire in this scene, not least of which is that it finally puts Templeton in his place. Kind of. McNulty can't tell on Templeton without exposing himself, and Templeton knows this, but still, the fact that someone knows he's a fraud, not just suspects it like his editor Gus, but knows beyond any shadow of a doubt, you can tell it really shakes him to his core, which is deeply satisfying for us, the audience, because Templeton is a complete piece of shit. Don't get me wrong, he's a great character, this is great storytelling, but oh my god, even amongst The Wire's most revolting inhabitants, I'm out there doing the Lord's work for you, Irv. Templeton more than holds his own, which is kind of weird when you think about it. I mean, it's not like he kills anyone. So why is this non-violent reporter so hated? I know that question sounds obvious, but it can't just be that he lies, that he's trying to pull off this huge deception. If that's all it took, then we'd feel the same way about him that we do about McNulty and Lester. Their fraud is way bigger than Templeton's. These two cost the city millions of dollars. They waste God knows how many police man hours trying to catch someone who doesn't exist. They desecrate create the corpses of homeless people whose relatives then go on to believe were tortured to death. Jesus, nobody deserves that. And to top it all off, they literally abduct this poor guy against his will. This is kidnapping. And yet, in spite of all that, I still wanted them to get away with it. As ethically screwed up as their plan was, at least they had a good reason. They were trying to bring down Baltimore's biggest drug gang, which is the job they were supposed to be doing. A job they were unjustly prevented from doing, and a job that if they'd simply been allowed to do in the first place, they never would have resorted to the drastic measures they took. Templeton has no such defense. That's why he's so scared in this scene. He knows if he's found out, he'll have no way to justify his actions. Nothing prevented him from doing his job. When he couldn't get a good quote at the baseball game, nothing stopped him from interviewing more people. When he interviewed this war vet, nothing stopped him from sticking with the account he'd been told. And of course, nobody forced him to lie about the serial killer. Hell, he could have investigated the serial killer and learned that was the lie. That would have been way bigger than the stuff he made up and would have given him all the attention and notoriety that he wanted, not to mention the satisfaction of knowing he actually deserved it. It was all right there for him. All he had to do was work harder to unearth the truth. But again, Templeton's biggest motivator was never the truth. It was always getting attention. When journalists and academics lie to get attention, society loses. We lose our trust in the very institutions we rely on to make informed decisions. This TED talk that I showed before, I've actually had this saved for years. Every so often I would go back and watch this and feel inspired. While I have no evidence that anything Ariely said here is false, how am I supposed to trust him anymore? This is a big part of why I felt so angry when I learned about him. Again, I don't buy his excuse that he was too stupid to understand what he was doing. Similar to Templeton, I think Ariely was smart enough to succeed without lying, allegedly. But the temptation to cut corners is just too strong for some. 
from, which I'm sure we can all understand, even if we don't condone. Ethics aside, ignoring the rules clearly gives you an advantage over those who follow them. Templeton really does rise up in the newspaper world while so many around him lose their jobs. McNulty and Lester really do get the funding they need while everyone around them has to make do with less. What the fuck is going on with our hours? Yeah. Even Marlow is able to take over the entire Baltimore drug trade, largely because he completely ignores the so-called code of the streets that everyone else follows. But I treated you like a son. I wasn't made to play the son. As I said in the beginning, The Wire is unquestionably one of the greatest shows ever, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the kind of show that leaves you feeling good about humanity. It definitely gets pretty dark in places. Perhaps the most disturbing part of Templeton's story is that it ends with him getting away with it, which really bothered me. Yet, as upsetting as this was, I don't think the point was just to be cynical and depressing for the hell of it. Again, we only know Templeton is a fraud because this is fictional. In real life, we'd be none the wiser. It's those Templetons the ones who walk unseen among us that I think The Wire was warning us about. And fortunately, it doesn't just warn us, it offers two ways to fight back. The first comes in the form of Gus, Templeton's heroic yet tragically fated editor. Gus is immediately suspicious of Templeton's too-good-to-be-true baseball story. I need a little more to go on if I'm a fly this thing. And he only grows more skeptical as Templeton's sources either complain about inaccuracies or remain conveniently anonymous. An anonymous attribution in a public setting? No need for it. Skepticism is an essential quality for an editor and a great quality for anyone. Contrary to its popular usage these days, skepticism does not mean calling anything that fails to support your interests fake, but it does mean extraordinary claims require evidence, which, like Gus, you then have to follow up on. You lie about comic because you weren't there. And there it was. I'll admit as a lazy person that extra work doesn't exactly appeal to me, but I think we can all agree it's a price worth paying. The other solution comes in the form of Rhonda, a prosecutor with the state's attorney's office. After McNulty and Lester's deception is uncovered, Rhonda tells them that because it'd be a PR nightmare for their hoax to go public, the powers that be have decided they're not going to be fired. Instead, they're welcome to stay on in some backroom job. However, that job will never again include doing actual police work. Not anything that's gonna find its way into a because McNulty and Lester are real police in the parlance of the show, they refuse this offer and quit. Staying on just to get paid would be beneath them, and would make them almost as bad as their bosses at City Hall, who lied just as much as they did, but in the legally acceptable form of juking the stats. She wants me to juke the stats for Cock Kitty. So do it. Burrell juke them before you. Warren Frazier before him. Which The Wire constantly explores in one form or another. The greatest conflict on the show is arguably between those who care about reality and those who care about perception. This holds true in the world of politics, law enforcement, journalism, education. If we're teaching the kids the test questions, what is it assessing in them? Nothing. It assesses us. The test scores go up. They can say the schools are improving. The scores stay down. They can't. Juking the stats. Even in the criminal world, Marlowe's greatest concern is always how he's perceived by others. My name was on the street! Heard you call Marlo a dick suck. You heard. You ain't sure? No matter if he said it or not, people think he said it. Can't let that shit go. Returning to Rhonda, though she was clearly appalled to learn what McNulty and Lester were up to, I'm willing to bet that a part of her supports what they did, or at the very least understands why they did it. After all, she works for the same stat-hungry, budget-slashing bosses that they do. And yet, even though I already said I was hoping these two got away with it, I still 100% support Rhonda's decision. I don't know if that makes me a hypocrite or not, or if it makes her one. The moment you came in here and offered that quid pro quo, you are guilty of obstruction of justice. You're right. But either way, if you were in her shoes and you cared about the truth, I think you'd have to do the same thing. Fraud is so insidious that there's really only one way to deal with it, and that's with zero tolerance. For my own part, now that I've learned about Dan Ariely and viewed the evidence against him for myself and found it robust, I don't think I'll be reading any more of his books or watching any more of his presentations. By the way, for, for, for brainstorming and creativity, doing things that are illegal and immoral, it's fine, as long as it's just in the brainstorming uh, phase.